My name is Ted Townsend. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the State of Tennessee Department of Economic and Community Development, and I am thrilled to be here as part of your host, and I also stand here uh, representing Governor Haslam, who, sorry he couldn't be here, he was here yesterday for the commission meeting, but he asked that I extend a warm Tennessee welcome to everyone here. You know, we have 400 plus folks that registered for this conference, and I'd like to take credit that Tennessee is the full reason for uh, that number. But, but I think it's more than that. I think it is truly a signal of all of our collective efforts for Appalachia. And if you think about the theme for this year's conference, the annual fall conference, which I fully recognize we're still in August, but we're going to call it fall because football season's almost here. Um, but the theme is Aspire Appalachia, collaborations in rural development. And that was a very intentional choice for this year's thematic approach to what we come to each and every year. Because Aspire is not just a theme for this year. It is something that I think we should all strive for in achieving in Appalachia. Uh, we have 420 counties in 13 states, 205,000 square miles, 1,000 miles from New York to Mississippi, represented in this room today all facing very similar challenges in our rural communities that largely have been left behind for various reasons. But those reasons are important for us to target, to be aggressive toward finding solutions. And we have to do it together, and that is why we must collaborate. We must band together and wear Appalachia in our hearts and in our intentions each and every day. It's pretty simple. The issues are complex, but I believe from everything that I see that everyone in this room gets it. And we are thrilled that you are here. And we hope that today's agenda provides you the content that you need to take it back to your communities, to share it, to lift them up. Aspire should be that hearkening call for all of our communities. We should aspire each and every day, continuing on into the future. So in Tennessee, we have, uh, we've had tremendous success over the last several years from Governor Haslam's administration on. We've announced over 120,000 jobs. Uh, just last year, we set a record, 20, almost 26,000 jobs and 5.5 billion in capital investment. But we recently did a study looking at where projects have placed since that time. And we laid it on a map of Tennessee. And then we said, well, let's look at the interstate systems and where those projects landed in relation to those. And I will tell you that 82% of all of those projects landed within a 10 mile radius on either side of an interstate. Now, all of our communities in Tennessee aren't on an interstate. And that disconnect shows and is reflected in the projects, the, the expansions and the recruitment that we have each and every day trying to introduce new industry to our state. So with that in mind, we have become an agency and a state with all of our partners focused on rural development. And I would like to take a moment right now just to ask all of our Team Tennessee members to stand, if you're not standing already. Those that are with all of our departments, I expect everybody to stand. So, all right, I've got Brooksy Carlton, who is our program manager and deputy assistant commissioner for rural development in the department. I've got Lindsey Gaines, Nancy, Brittany's back there. Amy New is our assistant commissioner of rural development. We have a, a strong presence here, but it's because these folks each and every day partner with your communities in Tennessee uh, to focus on those solutions and deliver those programs and initiatives. Uh, we could not have done this today without that great team. So if you will, join me in thanking them. So um, I've described the theme 
and I've told you what it's based on, but it's also based on the Appalachian Regional Commission's strategic plan, uh, which has a number of initiatives that are very reflective of today's agenda. So we ask that uh, you certainly go to those panels and sessions that uh, draw your heart and interest. Uh, we have a lot of great panelists that will participate in these, and these are subject matter experts that will share their knowledge and success and challenges, pain points, and opportunities for the future. Um, I would also like to recognize some of our guests here today, um, and, and you'll hear from uh, Dr. Nolan, Mayor Eldridge, our federal co-chair Earl Gold, and Congressman Rowe in a moment. Uh, but I would like to ask that uh, uh, Congressman Fleischman's Representative Tammy Merritt stand and be recognized for being here today. She, there she is. All right. Thank you, Tammy. I'm not sure, but is uh, Jane Jolly here with Senator Corker's office? Maybe not. All right. And then uh, Lana Moore with Senator Alexander's office? No, that's okay. I wanted to call them out because we, we truly appreciate our congressional partners uh, and their support of the ARC because it is, it is truly critical. Um, now, I can't step off of this stage without recognizing and thanking our sponsors who have made the last two days truly possible. And, and I hope that you all have enjoyed your time in Tennessee. We had uh, a great reception last night, and, and uh, we gathered some of you for the Johnson City Cardinals game and got you a hamburger and a drink, and hopefully you enjoyed that despite the Cardinals not winning and beating those Yankees. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry, New York. I know you're in the house. We love you. Uh, but let me thank the sponsors. Pathway Lending, if Clint and Hank would stand and be recognized. Thank you. Networks Sullivan Partnership. Anyone here from there, that group? No? Okay, we'll move forward. Uh, GRW Engineering. And you can clap after all of these, too. It's fine. <laughs> J.R. Wofford and Company. Thank you. I think Lynn Music is here with S and M.E. Is she here? Maybe so. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, our department is thrilled to sponsor this, um, but also the Tennessee Development District Association. All of those members that are here, Mark, Terry, Susan. Go ahead and stand up. Stand up, Mark. I know. There's Susan. Okay, where's Terry? There's Terry. He's over there. Thank you all very much. All right, I'm going to uh, hand things over to Dr. Nolan. And, and let me just say, Dr. Nolan, I, I appreciate you guys hosting us. We're right here all encroaching on the campus, and you have in, invited us. And I think some folks went over last night and learned how to do some dancing. So uh, we expect them to pay that forward and teach us some moves. But uh, you are much more than just dancing. You are a critical driver of the economy here in Northeast Tennessee, and we thank you so much for hosting us here today. Dr. Nolan, Brian Nolan with ETSU President. Well, thank you, and good morning. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of East Tennessee State University, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Johnson City. Uh, you are on the doorstep of a major research institution that institution surrounds you today. It is not only an institution that surrounds this conference, it's an institution that surrounds the region. We have about 14,500 students who call ETSU home. We offer degrees in everything from bluegrass old time and country music studies, and you had the chance to hear the talents of our faculty and staff last night, all the way to degrees in the Quillen College of Medicine. Across that spectrum and portfolio of academic programs, you'll find uh, distinct steeples of excellence. The Quillen College of Medicine, top 10 in the country for its focus on rural and family practice. We have a top 30 College of Public Health, which is making a difference in the lives of the people of the region as it helps to fight the opioid epidemic that is gripping all of our communities. But as you look across all of our programs and services, what you'll find is an institution committed to a mission that has been constant since we opened our doors in 1911. And that's a mission of improving the quality of life for the people of our region. I like to call us the land-grant university of central Appalachia. If you look at a service organization, if you look at a community outreach effort, if you look at a healthcare clinic, you'll find an ETSU alum at the center of it. 
And in fact, if you were to draw a 30-mile circle around our present location, 80% of the people with baccalaureate degrees in that circumference received their degrees from ETSU. So I think you would be hard-pressed in Appalachia to find an institution more committed to service, more committed to making a difference in the lives of the people of the region, and we're honored to have you here. We're also committed to partnerships. Uh, we have, since we opened our doors in 1911, uh, operated a training school. Uh, at the time, it was a normal school. Now it's the university school. Uh, and that's a school that's operated in conjunction with Washington County. Uh, there are a few universities in Appalachia that run a public school on their campus that serves as a demonstration for best practice and pedagogy, as well as for outreach across the region. It's possible because of the person that I now have the honor to introduce, Mayor Dan Eldridge, the mayor of Washington County, a good friend, a great colleague, and an inspirational leader for our region. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Eldridge to the stage. Good morning. On behalf of the Washington County Commission, the City of Johnson City, and the Town of Jonesboro, I want to welcome each of you to our community. It is really good to have you. What a crowd. This is fantastic. You know, at the, the reception last night, I had several comments from people about um, their, their first perceptions of this area. And, um, and several of those comments were around the fact that there seems to be a lot going on. And you know there is. It's, uh, it's exciting. We aren't recovered, but our recovery is accelerating in this region. And, and we're very thankful for that. I know that, uh, I, I want you to know though that despite the, uh, the accelerating recovery that we're experiencing, we still have challenges just as all of you have. You know, across Appalachia, we're, we're faced with, uh, with at least our share of challenges. And I'm excited about the opportunity that we've got here today because when I look across this room, wow, look at the experience, the knowledge, uh, the get it done kind of people that fill this place. We've got a unique opportunity here today uh, to hear some things, um, some, some ways forward, some new ideas, to share ideas, to talk about what's worked in our communities, uh, to learn, and, and I hope, I think, I expect, for myself at least, to take some things away from here today that, uh, that will benefit Washington County. So I hope for all of you that you've had a good experience in Washington County, uh, that you will come back, visit us again, give us the opportunity to host you, and uh, I hope you have a great conference today. And it is my pleasure now to introduce our federal co-chair, Mr. Earl Gold. Good morning, it's great to see all of you. Uh, first, I want to thank Ted and Brooksy and Lindsay and Amy for this great conference, for all the work that they have put forward and, and uh, organized to put together this, uh, this great agenda. I want to express my appreciation to, to Brian for letting us use uh, his campus and to be a part of it, his, um, his day. Uh, the work of ETSU and, and what, they've, what the university has contributed to ARC over the years has been incredible. Um, this, of course, was the home of Bruce Berenger for many years, and Bruce was a very active member of the uh, health advisory group. Um, uh, and has, we use him all the time, and he's just an important part of our family. Um, also, the work of the uh, Appalachian Teaching Project has been centered here for a number of years, and we certainly appreciate uh, that effort. Um, but, you know, it's really good to see all of you here. You know, in my, in my work the last few years, I've had, I travel uh, pretty much. And in, in that travel, I have the opportunity to meet these incredible folks who live throughout the 420 counties of Appalachia, who get up every day and they work very hard to see that their community is a better place for, the, for their kids and their grandkids than it was for themselves. And it's, it's really like an army. It's like an Appalachian army of folks who are just incredibly dedicated to this work. And what we hope today is that this isn't really a day off. This really isn't just a day at the conference. But this is a day to figure out who else is engaged here, who else is committed, who else is 
working along the same goals and the same aspirations that you do in the work that you do and the, and the effort that you put forward for your community, for your county, for your, your part of Appalachia. So it's great to see you. It's going to be work. It's not going to be all. It's not, it's not a day off. And we really hope that when you walk out the door, you're going to be tired, but you're going to be full of ideas and full of energies to go back to your community and work just as hard. So it is really is my pleasure also today to introduce somebody who, who has delivered 5,000 babies, way beyond my understanding of the world. <laughs> but uh, Congressman Phil Rowe, who represents uh, Johnson City, uh, not only has, in, has, has delivered 5,000 babies in his lifetime, but he also has served as the mayor of Johnson City. He has been a great supporter of ARC and has been very helpful to us uh, in Congress um, over the last several years since he was first elected in 2008. Uh, but today he's uh, coming to join us to uh, extend his, uh, his welcome uh, to all of us at, in Johnson City. Congressman Rowe, thanks so much. Thanks very much and welcome to Johnson City and I want to personally thank you because um, Congress only has a 10% approval rating. I'm glad to get invited anywhere, so thank you very much for <laughs> being here. Um, as Earl said, I, I, this is my home, so welcome to my home, Johnson City, Tennessee. And it's a, it's a privilege to host you all here today. And I'm going to go over a few things very quickly because I know you've got a, an expert panel up. But I was... Um, I, I grew up in rural America. The, the county I grew up in Tennessee was Stewart County, which at the time, it's in Middle Tennessee, it was the smallest county in the state. It's not even longer. It's grown some. But I understand rural America very well because it's where I grew up on a farm. And I grew up without indoor plumbing or running water. I understand how that is. I understand you have to make a decision at 4 o'clock on a cold winter morning just how bad you have to go to the bathroom. I do understand that. <laughs> You deal with people like that in rural America and Appalachia where we live. And I, I looked at our country, and we're becoming divided as a country. And I, I looked at where the economic recovery is occurring in the country, and I looked at the last several recessions we've had in America. And between 1992 and 96, when we recovered from that recession, over 420,000 new businesses were formed. In the 2000 recession, between 2002 and 2006, about 400,000 businesses, new businesses, not jobs, but businesses, that's millions of jobs. During this recovery, uh, between 2010 and 14, only 167,000 new businesses were formed. And the message actually gets worse for us where we live. If you look at the 3,100 county cities that act like cities and counties across America, 20 of them, two zero, accounted for 50% of all the new business formation in America. 20 counties. When I drive out of Washington, one of the amusing things I do is count the cranes. There were 18 cranes working there. Well, I hope there are 18 cranes working in Appalachia, rural Appalachia, but I doubt it. And if you, if you look even more deeply, 60% of counties in America in the last six years have, gone, have had a net business loss. That's a challenge we have. So we have, a, and we have with that, really a depression that goes with that. When you see your jobs leaving, your young people leave, and it makes it very difficult for rural America. So that's what we're here to do. I, I have seen the ARC leverage money, and we've seen it. I'll just personally give you one quick story. There was a small school in Cobb County called Grassy Fork. It's, it's way off the interstate. Uh, most people couldn't find it on a map with a, with a magnifying glass. They didn't have running water. They, they had a well that they used for the school, and if it got dry like it is now, they couldn't wash the dishes and flush the toilets at the same time. Through a variety of ARC grant, uh, CDBG grants, other uh, individuals giving, that school now has running potable water. That's what we're about, and c the communities up there, also individuals could hook onto that water and have for the first time uh, utility water. That's what we need to be doing here and attracting and keeping people in this wonderful region that we live and call home. Uh, look, this is where they're going to throw dirt on me. This is one of the most beautiful areas in the world, I think, and it's a privilege to live here. And I'm going to finish by telling you a little bit about the first congressional district of Tennessee. There are 12 counties that you're in right now. Uh, it is the only district in America that's had two presidents, Andrew Jackson and Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Jackson was the first person to hold my seat. He practiced law in Jonesboro, Tennessee, just 
a few miles down the road where we're heading next. Uh, also, another famous Tennessean uh, was Davy Crockett, who held this seat. He gave uh, one of the most amazing speeches that's ever been given. He couldn't get the Congress to go along with what he, what he wanted them to do, so he stood up in the House and he said, you can go to hell, I'm going to Texas. And so um, <laughs> I sort of understand that from time to time. Uh, it, it didn't work out too well for him, but anyway, <laughs> he did get to Texas. Um, Sam Houston also was, uh, was the only person, he also was held with seats, the only person to be governor of two states, both Texas and Tennessee. And I'd like to point out to my Texas friends that there would not be a Texas if it weren't for Tennessee. So they don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. One last thing, I co-chair the Doctors' Caucus in Congress, and um, it's, we have an opioid epidemic going on in rural America and other places. And we recognize that there are 15 physicians in the Congress, and we very much are focused on that and just passed some opioid legislation, and I hope that we can be stop this terrible epidemic that we had in our state of Tennessee last year. More people died of opioid prescription drug overdose deaths and died in car wrecks. That's unbelievable. So one other uh, closing comment, a good friend of mine, uh, and he is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, uh, Hal Rogers and Hal will be termed out at the end of this term. We lose a lot of horsepower and a lot of support when Hal's no longer chairman of the, of the uh, because the, the budget is under pressure. As you know, we're running a deficit, and people are always looking for a place to cut money. And I have been very supportive of ARC because I've seen and appreciate the good work because it's not about the people in this room. It's about the people we serve. That's what this is all about. So welcome to Johnson City, to the 1st Congressional District, to the great state of Tennessee, and we hope you have a tremendously successful conference. Congressman, thank you very much. We are uh, very honored that you are here today, and, and we appreciate your service to our country to the state of Tennessee and, and all of the, the membership in Congress. Thank you so much for your leadership. All right, so I will ask the panelists to start assembling here on stage. Uh, Scott Hamilton, the executive director of the ARC, will be moderating this, and, and Earl, if you will join us. Uh, while they get up on stage, I would like to just um, take a moment of privilege and recognize Susan Reed and the 1st Tennessee Development District. Uh, Congressman, you'd be very proud of of all of their prowess here uh, in the district. And I, I can't thank you enough, Susan, for you and your team and all that you've done to organize the events uh, over the last couple of days. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right, I'm also going to remind everyone, do you know the, the hashtag for the conference? Hashtag ARC2016. We expect there to be a bevy of activity on Twitter today. And for someone, lucky person, will receive a prize uh, later on at lunch uh, from the International Storytelling Center in Jonesboro, which you heard the, the congressman and the mayor talk about earlier. So please tweet as much as you can. Also, I will remind you that we are live streaming today. All of the events at the conference are live streaming, so we expect you to uh, have your, your biggest Appalachian smiles on and, uh, and, and make those that couldn't be here aware of that service so that they can participate today, even though they're not physically present. And then uh, I will also, I don't think I have to remind you, we are at capacity. It's fantastic. It's a great problem to have. Some of the breakout rooms will be at uh, full capacity. There will be standing room only in some cases. So just be patient with it. Understand that that's likely to happen, uh, but that is also a good thing. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to Scott Hamilton, Executive Director. Ted, thank you very thank you. much. Good morning, everybody. I want to add my welcome and uh, say thank you for your time and your interest in uh, coming to our conference. It's, uh, it's been a great morning and we look forward to a ter terrific afternoon as well. Uh, right quick, to, uh, just to do uh, some very quick introductions for you for our panel. Earl Goal was unanimously confirmed as their federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission by the Senate on March 10th in tw uh, 2010. Uh, Bill Shelton 
He serves as the director of the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. He is also Virginia's alternate to the ARC Commission. Olivia Collier, she is North Carolina's ARC Program Manager. And Jill Foyes is the Executive Director of the Northwest Pennsylvania Regional Planning and Development Commission in Oil City, Pennsylvania. So I want to welcome them this morning as well and thank you for participating in the conference. The breakout, or this uh, panel session today, is uh, bringing ARC's mission to life in rural Appalachia. ARC's mission is to innovate, partner, and to invest, to build community capacity and strengthen economic growth in Appalachia. So what I want to do is ask some questions and have a conversation with the panel. If we have time, we'll take questions from the audience as we wrap up this panel. But I'd like to ask each of you first is to tell the audience a bit about yourself. Uh, we'll start with Earl and we'll know your story, your role with ARC, and a success you're proud of. So I have two questions. Why do I have to answer the questions? Why, why aren't I asking them? <laughs> And second, why am I the only one up here without a microphone? <laughs> but that's beside the point. Um, so my background is, is really not very remarkable. Um, I, 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 um, I'm from Pennsylvania, and I started um, working for an organization called the Pennsylvania, right out, out of graduate, graduate school, Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs, which is about a thousand local governments, which uh, has uh, communities of 37 to 37,000. And in that experience, I uh, worked for uh, uh, the director who had been a professor at Penn State, PhD in political science. And he was kind of my um, instructor on what local, Pennsylvania local government was. I got bored of that job and I went and I worked for the mayor of the city of Harrisburg in the first year of the community development block grant funds. And we were sure we were only get that money one year. Well, it's you know, about 35 years later uh, and the program still going. So my experience really started out at a, as a local government official. I was the assistant to the mayor, I was elected to the city council, I served as president. And that really sort of gives me or gave me a sense of there's certain things you have to do as a local official. Sometimes you have to raise taxes, sometimes you have to cut services, but you always have to figure out how to solve a problem. And the challenge always is, is how to reach beyond where you are, and how do you make sure that the future community is brighter than it was before you got there. And um, that was sort of, I think, the foundation of, of, of how I look at things and how I try to approach the challenge that we have at ARC. But it's, um, uh, it, it sort of left a mark uh, as I moved on through state government and have worked for the, for the federal government a couple of different times. Um, and have really, when I came to this job, um, in, in my confirmation statement, there was, just, there was one sentence that probably belonged to me. And that sentence was that I was committed to um, seeing that every dollar that ARC invested was investment in the, in the to help uh, and support the working families of Appalachia, but was also a, um, um, that we also needed to have a return on that dollar for U.S. taxpayers. And it's really sort of that dichotomy of, of uh, working to see that there are real benefits both to families and also a real return to the taxpayers that really, I think, drives me and really sets the parameters that I think are important at ARC. Hi, as, as Scott said, my name is Jill Foyes, and I'm from the other corner of Pennsylvania. And uh, I am currently the executive director of the Northwest Pennsylvania Regional Planning and Development Commission. And I always say I've grown up in the LDD system. I was hired into North Central's regional planning in 2000 to oversee the entrepreneurial programs. I was the entrepreneurial network coordinator of the Northwest Pennsylvania Regional. It was a terrible business card. Um, <laughs> But the, the, we had a three-prong approach to entrepreneurship, and that was my charge, was to oversee um, not only uh, a state-run program, which was the Self-Employment Assistance Program, which helped dislocated workers start their own businesses. 
we tied that to an SBA microloan program to help those individuals get up and running. And then there was a state program at the time, which was called the Entrepreneurial Network Initiative through the Department of Community and Economic Development. And we use that as a platform to kind of be a support system for our entrepreneurs in our region. And we created the Entrepreneurs Club, and we would meet monthly, and those individuals would tell us what their concerns were, what their interests were, what the problems were that they were having, and we would go out and find people who could speak to those. And then the next month, we would meet again. So that's how I come into the system. Um, in 2010, I was promoted to oversee the enterprise development program, which was the core components of, of those programs within, uh, within enterprise development. I was in that position until, for 18 months until I was offered this position, which brought me back to the region where I've spent 98% of my life. Um, so I'm really proud to lead our organization serving the eight counties that I grew up in. So I've been doing this a little while. Um, I started in uh, state government back in 1978, and my initial entry uh, was uh, in the area of working with local governments on grants management. So I've kind of started at the bottom level of, uh, uh, the congressman mentioned several of the programs I've worked on quite a bit, uh, the Community Development Block Grant, now IERC. But for 20 years, I was there laboring in the trenches, working with everybody and trying to structure deals, structure projects, figure out, and it was very transactional where and how you respond to significant problems, uh, rural development and community development problems. So I developed this passion for community development. I'm perfectly happy doing that kind of work and was uh, enjoying life and feeling, feeling like I was making a difference uh, uh, and didn't have uh, quite as many responsibilities. But in 1998, uh, sort of, uh, circumstances, I got the call from the governor's office and asked would I be willing to head an agency, uh, the Department of Housing and Community Development, um, and with a certain amount of trepidation, stepping out of a career civil service kind of realm, I moved into that appointive realm, um, and, it, and it has been a great experience for me. Uh, it continued the work that I had already been doing, the passion for community development, for working with communities on significant problems, and allowed me to uh, even exercise more influence over policy and direction. Uh, and I think that's the message I want to carry to you today, that, that for, for me personally, it was about making sure that the investments of resources are exactly that, that we are showing impact and, and truly investing. Um, when I first started, um, I was very proud of every project that I worked on, uh, but there, were, there was a grant to a single entity and you would see the benefit of that project, but the, most of those were not very well linked together. And as we have grown over the years in experience, we realize, especially in rural communities and in the community development field, that this networking and ability to link things is really um, the secret to whether we're going to be successful or not. So most of the work that I've been focused on for the last 20 years have been how to connect the dots and pull people together on a regional basis or connecting communities that have similar issues uh, and to think more creatively about how these resources really do have impact. Scott asked for a couple of examples or an example, uh, and there are a couple of them that I want to mention. Uh, one was early on, I'd done all this work in the area of uh, infrastructure and water and sewer in Southwest Virginia, where many of uh, Virginia colleagues are from. Um, you know, it was very common to, for uh, water systems, if they existed, to run out of water. And most areas um, had groundwater that was influenced by mining activity, and we had all kinds of issues there. Through a concerted effort over about 10 or 15 years, uh, those communities now are predominantly on municipal water systems, uh, and we're, while we have issues with water, uh, we don't hear about water outages. We don't hear about water buffaloes hauling water up and down the road trying to solve uh, problems. And that experience led then to thinking more about how do you do the same thing in the economic arena, and so where we've been lately is thinking about uh, if you're trying to revitalize and rebuild economies, how do you do that same thinking of linking those communities together in new ways? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. But that's what I'm most proud of, that we've been able to just keep building on that foundation of collaboration, cooperation, and working together. And I think it's paying dividends. Good morning. As Scott said, I'm Olivia Collier. I manage the ARC program in North Carolina. And I got my start at the Department of Commerce when I was 16. Um, 
we have a program in North Carolina called the Governor's Page Program, and I did that program in this, that summer between my junior and senior year of high school, and I had a little desk in what is now our secretary's copy room. And so I spent um, a week that summer running papers back and forth between the governor's office and commerce and other places. But I got to interact with some folks and kind of, as a 16-year-old, see government from a different perspective. And so then I went off to college, and during my, between my junior and senior year of college, I came back to the department as a governor's intern in the um, press office for our department. So I got to see all kinds of things. And I got to see economic development and community development from a really different perspective than what I had been learning in the textbooks in school. And so after I left that, um, that year of my senior year of college, I kind of decided I wanted to go to graduate school. And so I stayed in graduate school. I went to East Carolina University um, in the eastern part of the state. And during graduate school, um, I got my first real job in a local government. It's called the Town of Scotland Neck. It is in the eastern part of the state. Um, they are famous for having no stoplights, and they park in the middle of the street. Their parking is in the middle of the street. And I was hired to help them figure out how do they use their assets. They're, they don't really have any industry there, and their assets are tobacco farms. Well, when tobacco season's over, what do you do with those farms? Well, when tobacco season ends, hunting begins. And this community is home to one of the largest population of white-tailed deer in the country. And so I worked with a lot of farmers and economic developers and tourism officials in that community to try to figure out what do we do? How do we make some additional revenue off these farms? And so we started a project called Developing Our Outdoor Resources, and we promoted this community as one where you could come for a fee and you could stay in a, a cabin and you would have a guide that would put you in a tree. And um, for those of you that are not hunters like me, they would tell you the deer come from that direction. <laughs> and we will come back and get you a couple hours later. And so I did that um, for about a year and a half, and lo and behold, a job in the press office in a former division of the Department of Commerce opened. And so I took that role, and I did that for a couple years. And then my predecessor, Sarah Stuckey, Chuck, as many of you have been around ARC family, would have know Chuck. Chuck started talking to me about, she wanted to retire one day, and that never, retirement, what in the world? Um, she had done this job for 33 years, and so I started shadowing Chuck at the same time I did um, CDBG environmental review and compliance for a couple of years. And so I've been doing this full time now for about nine and a half years. And what several people have made the comment about using ARC dollars as an investment. And I've really tried to look at projects as how are these investments in communities? Are we, if we're only, if we're spending $10,000, which sometimes we just spend small amounts of money, but that $10,000 in a community can have huge returns if we're really smart about what we're doing. And so I've really tried to do that. Successful sometimes, not successful, and we learn from those times when we're not successful. So that's, my background has helped me kind of look at that, our investments in those ways. Very good, thank you. What we have with our panel is really the four branches of the ARC family tree with the federal office, the state alternates, the program manager, and then also the local development districts. They're all components of how ARC uh, moves forward and achieves its mission and in, in investment strategies. Over the last year, we have been involved in developing our new five-year investment plan. And I think many of you may be familiar with it. It is posted on uh, ARC's website at arc.gov. I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, as that's been released, I'd like to ask each of our uh, panelists, uh, how does your organization bring to life or support the implementation of ARC's new five-year investment strategy? And Earl, we'll start with the federal perspective on that. Man, <laughs> Well, first of all, you're hiring an executive director. <laughs> um, you know, I think that um, you, know, you, you actually start implementing it as you begin to put it together. Uh, and in developing it, in the process that we used in developing it, really laid the foundation for our ability to move forward, because the, the challenge is to, um, we want folks to stretch. This is all about stretching. And it's about taking federal resources in a way 
and stretching the resources, stretching our capacity, and it's really stretching out the challenges and the way communities meet those challenges. And so we started by having a conversation with about 500 of our closest friends in four different locations throughout the region. And we didn't ask them what they thought we should do, but we asked them what their assets were, what their challenges are, what their priorities were. And we really got back at, uh, it, it was not, you would think that when you do this in 420 counties and 13 states, from New York to Mississippi, you would get just a bunch of uh, ideas that didn't really fit together, but, we, but they really fit together. And I think that um, uh, the document that we have, I, uh, so these days I actually, I, I travel with it. It's, uh, it's a document that I include uh, when I go places because um, because we want it to be alive, and we want to be, we want everyone to use it, and I and I use it, and the keys to it are not just the five priorities, but if you go back and you talk about what our commitments are and how we look at issues and challenges, and the importance of being collaborative, uh, and being impactful, being um, and, and being accountable, that those are, are key parts of this. But I think that that how we implement this is to a, have, conferences like, have conversations like this one where we lay out in this conference different parts of the plan and we talk about ways of, of being able to implement them. We also will, uh, in our work each day and in our grant proposals, that when we, when we lay out the power initiative, we have priorities within power, but we also say, this is, the, this is the driving force. These five goals in here are really the driving force in how we look at projects that we want to f invest in and work that we want to encourage. So I would say that, that it's part of our conversation. It's an important part of our technical assistance and our conferences. It's an important part of the way we write our priorities for funding and the way we make judgments about investments and that we're going to pursue these five goals and pursue the other parts of this document as we do business every day. You know, ARC was created in 1964 and the purpose was to work to see that this region was no longer separate from the rest of the United States but was a part of it and it had, was, had economic parity with with the United States. And that really lays the foundation for everything that we do. And that's really the key to this document and it's an important part of really every investment that we make. Well, Olivia is a program manager uh, for a state and you've got your colleagues are, are here as well. Is how, how does, um, as a program manager, how do you look at ARC's new five-year investment strategy as you move the work forward for ARC in North Carolina? Well, when we went through the um, strategic planning process, as Earl mentioned, um, we had a listening session in West North Carolina and Far City. I think it was the first listening session. And during that, there were lots of things that came up. And it was very interesting as those listening sessions went around the region, the things that were brought up in Far City were very similar to the things that were brought up in the other locations. And so what is in that strategic plan has had 13 states say this is important to us. Those five goals are important to us. And the way I've been able to use it as a program manager is really asking communities a simple question. And there, we have six LDDs in West North Carolina and they are represented in the room today. And they are critical to helping me implement the strategic plan and we all um, they may tell you offline that they didn't enjoy the experience that I'm about to describe <laughs> but last Tuesday we were in a conference room for from 10 a.m. to about 3 p.m. and we went through every single project for the entire region and the reason for that was asking the question not just as a program manager but from the local perspective 
are these projects, whether it is from a nonprofit, a county government, a city government, a community college, a university, a regional organization, what have you, whether it is asking for $10,000 to do um, Wi-Fi infrastructure in a downtown, buy a piece of training equipment for a community college, running a water and sewer line, or paving 2.5 miles of access road, will this project result in a community moving towards econ economic success? And we went through over 35 projects. And we had some lengthy conversations about a couple of them. And you, when in those conversations, if you come back to that strategic plan and say, is this a smart investment? Or is this just something that's gonna happen once? And then maybe they'll come back to you five, 10 years later and say, oh, we need some more capital because this broke. Or is this really gonna help a community leverage something that's gonna make a difference? And so for me, and I think I can speak for the 12 other program managers who are all here, and I want to let you all know, that's, this has been a really long time since all 13 program managers. We talk on a very regular basis. Um, but for all of us to be in the same room and talk about issues together, this is the first time in a while that we've all been face to face. And we actually talked about Scott's question on Monday afternoon about how are we using this plan? Um, when our communities apply for projects, we ask them to pick a goal and to tell us how are they gonna implement that goal. And some communities struggle with that and we have to use that plan as the document that helps them understand where this is gonna get them. Um, and it's been a good document to be able to reference folks to. You, you mentioned your work with the LDB, so Jill, when as an executive director of a local development district, what, how do you look at the ARC plan as you're looking through projects? Well, much like Olivia had talked about, we do the, the same type of assessment on a local level. And we've just recently, when we gather our ARC projects, we have brought together our, um, utilizing our EDA SEDS committee, which is county planners from each of our eight counties as well as economic development staff from all of our eight counties. And we prioritize and we talk about um, how do you move those projects forward? Are those projects sustainable? Um, and, and do they add value to what you're doing? Um, when you look at the five, um, the five items that are in the strategic plan, you know, workforce and economic development come to mind and those are the things that you know, from the perspective of the LDDs, we do every day. And in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Department of Community and De Economic Development use the LDDs very well to, to kind of roll out a lot of the economic development programs that we have. Um, one of which is called PREP, which is the Partnerships for Regional Economic Performance. And it really is that integrated delivery system for economic development in our Commonwealth. Um, we don't, we don't have as many successes with attracting big businesses. We're not, you know, chasing smokestacks like we did, you know, in the in decades before. So we're looking at building our businesses from the ground up. So the the role of the LDDs in, in the state of Pennsylvania are to provide those regional programs that counties couldn't afford. And for us, the core cup programs are government contracting, working with the de de the uh, Department of Defense. Um, export marketing, which is another state program, and business finance. Those are the things that we're doing at a, a 10,000 foot level from a regional level that assists with that economic development. And then the other issue that we have, and I've said this throughout my career, you can't have economic development without workforce development or vice versa. You, one doesn't work without the other. And a lot of our very rural counties are saying it's not that we don't have jobs, job openings. We don't have people. We literally don't have enough people in our counties. Um, so we started having those conversations as, as an eight county region. If you were to make a list of all the things that you would want in an employee, what would those be? You know, and it's work ethic and it's leadership and it's all of those things. And we came full circle. So uh, an initiative that we're very proud of from a workforce development perspective, it, we kicked it off last October, is trying to recruit military, separating military into the Northwest Pennsylvania region. Um, we were just successful in receiving a grant through um, the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, when you fill out your registration in Pennsylvania, it's do you wanna donate $3 to uh, the Veterans Trust Fund, so we've received dollars from them. So the core components of what that is, is we're trying to 
market our region to separating veterans and their spouses. We've entered into a contract with uh, what's called Recruit Military, which is an online system that allows separating and separated military and their spouses, and there's about 800,000 of them that are enrolled in the program to, uh, to look at jobs postings from our eight counties. If one of our businesses were to do that, to contract with Recruit Military, it would cost them $2,000 to do that. The commission took on the role of the contractee and every business in our eight counties is able to do that. We hold the contract and everyone's able to do that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to market our region, connect the 800,000 people who are posting on that position, are on that website to attract them to Northwest Pennsylvania. When you look at, um, you know, when you look at the track record of those who've been in, served in the military, those are the type of people that you certainly want to attract to your region. So those are things that, that from a specific LDD's perspective, we're doing to try to drive that economic and workforce development component of the, of the strategic plan. Bill is an alternate, and a lot of times in the uh, area development program particularly, the, the, the projects are very grassroots and make their way up to, to the alternate to, to look at it and make that recommendation over to the federal office for consideration. As, as, as you do that, how do you consider ARC's strategic plan uh, as uh, a part of the projects as you're looking at uh, what uh, the state of Virginia would send forward? I think where I need to start from is, you know, for a state role and as an alternate, uh, one of the, I think most of you know this, each state has uh, an alignment of a state plan of how it responds to ARC. So one of the first things that happens um, if you're, you know, if you're an appointee of a governor and there's a state economic development structure and strategy, what we're looking for is alignment. So a lot of the work that we do is thinking across the spectrum of where uh, the opportunities are to align ARC resources along with other resources to have the maximum impact. Uh, and there's a great alignment. And so the first uh, effort out of the gate was to try to figure out where those synergies were. Uh, as a community development agency, I think uh, at least our department thinks about this in a little different way. Um, if you really think about uh, being part of an economic development uh, effort uh, of a whole state and then figuring out how do you then parse resources down to where they're needed the most, if you're in the community development field, uh, where we focus or where things are not happening, where we need to stimulate activity uh, and be more aggressive uh, at state investment. Um, it's mentioned a couple times earlier about you know, the, the, what growth is happening in the country now is happening in certain communities and along certain corridors. Um, and you know, there's a classic uh, discussion that goes on is, is it, should we be investing in areas that are, that are declining or are we fighting a losing battle? If you're, if you're raised in the community development field, if you're passionate about what you do, you're not giving up on communities. You're trying to figure out how do you then um, prepare those communities for uh, changing the game, if you will, and moving in a different direction. We dif use different terms of economic restructuring or trying to figure out what's the next strategy for how do you create the, uh, the opportunity in those communities uh, to respond. Uh, and what I will tell you is that, that the current ARC strategic plan aligns very nicely with where we were already headed to, uh, and so this has, has been a great opportunity. The one thing I would have to say that, um, and, and give um, some recognition to, ARC is not a very big number. Uh, it seems like a big number, I would say 70 million, but when you spread it over 13 states and the time it gets allocated down, it's, a, it's not that large. And scheme of things, in the budget of my department, it's less than 3%. It's more like 2.5% of the overall agency budget. But it is the most strategic money, especially in addressing the issues I just talked about, because it is so flexible that you can move it in directions and partner with communities in directions uh, where nobody else is willing to go. Um, I work very closely with other agencies like EDA and HUD and other federal agencies, rural development. Um, they're great programs, but they're, they're like turning battleships and cruisers, uh, you know, that they can't respond, the rules don't fit neatly. ARC has allowed us to do that experimentation. And so just as a concrete example, for some 15 years or so now, maybe 20 years, we have been looking at this whole issue of, of how are you creating the next economy in these communities. Uh, well, fundamentally, we're an all the above organization. If the next big employer wants to come in, we're going to respond to that. But what do you do in the interim? Or how do you make it more attractive for that employer to come in? And so uh, the logic has been that we're investing and in trying to return vibrancy to these communities, and it is changing the way uh, that they respond. Uh, if you lost your economic base, if you lost the 
uh, one plant or the two plants that were in the community or coal mining has declined, um, it, it can uh, seem pretty daunting to figure out how do you move to, uh, uh, to a new economic opportunity. And many times what we hear from uh, folks are that they're still kind of stuck in old school of thinking about, well, it's coming back. But the reality is um, we don't think that we'll be successful unless you create the opportunity for people to see these communities in a very positive light. I mean, we, what, what do we all know about rural Appalachia? These are great communities to live in. Congressman mentioned it, this is where he was born, this is where he will return, uh, um, as I think the way you put it, uh, where the dirt will go over you <laughs> in the end, and we, I think you all feel that way, and we feel that way. So what, why is it that the rest of the world doesn't see that? So what we're about is creating the opportunities to tell that story better to the rest of the world. So we've been emphasizing things like cultural heritage, outdoor recreation, opportunities, and you know the, the outcomes look like tourism, and they are tourism. but. The reality is the outcome is showcasing the high quality of life, the vibrancy of these communities, and attracting the outside world in, because I think at the end of the day, um, where the opportunity lies is to uh, cater to that outside world, to, to bring that back, because ultimately you're trying to bring in investment, you're trying to bring in new job growth, and that uh, can happen in two ways. You can recruit it in, or you can grow it, and we want to do both of those things. And so by uh, where they intersect, uh, in our opinion, is where this high quality of life is showcased. Uh, and then the, the final piece I'll mention, Scott, is I think there's a hidden opportunity that's on the agenda today and we need to double down on, and that is um, there in various areas of Appalachia that we have not had always, we've had very entrepreneurial people, but not a history of supporting entrepreneurism and small business development. And this is a great opportunity. If we create these opportunities for new business opportunities, there are people aching to get into business and we just need to be more supportive and create the environment for that. Uh, and so we feel like the ARC plan aligns really well with what we're trying to do, of uh, bringing new investment into the region to showcase what the quality is there. And then uh, hopefully that ends up being the catalyst for uh, higher growth rates in those communities because folks are coming back in. Um, and I will just close with you know one of the things that uh, if you go to the session on um, cultural heritage, you'll hear a presentation. One of the things we measure, um, you think about jobs and investment, but we're also measuring how many folks with four-year and six-year degrees are coming into communities. And this is an important thing to think about because um, you know, the thing you always hear is exodus from rural communities, rural America. What we want to do is to create that vibrancy and bring people back into these communities. So Bill, that's, that's great to segue into the next section and the question I have, for, and we'll start with you on that. As you mentioned it in your uh, opening comments and, and you talked about um, investments and having a strategy, so in, in being successful. So if you're going to be successful, what are the elements of a successful project and, and what does successful collaboration look like to, to make those projects successful? Sure, well, I'm sitting between two people who both mentioned this, that uh, I, I think that the, uh, the uh, idea of a uh, strategy that transcends any one community uh, is so critical. We're going to continue to do projects in each community, but what we want to see is how that begins to link back to other things. And so if that's um, someone who's pursuing entrepreneurial development, we want to know that there is actually, uh, it's linked to marketing efforts, it's linked to the concept of if we're doing outdoor recreation, that there's some support mechanism that, um, that you're actually building towards a crescendo of, of, of a number of businesses that are going to create critical mass so that um, you end up being able to handle uh, destination-oriented travelers who come in. Uh, one at a time probably is not a good way to do that. Thinking regionally uh, is the way to do that. So in, in our uh, approach, uh, we actually started ironically with a, a, from a much different standpoint. If you think about one of the uh, bit more visible aspects of what's going on with the, with the economy, and this has been going on for a long time, we saw um, small towns in Appalachia as being kind of the cultural centers, the commerce centers, uh, for the most part, uh, being disinvested. Uh, whether that's the large retailer coming in or whether that's just the natural trends. You saw vacant storefronts, you saw declining buildings, uh, and we are, uh, do a lot of thinking about urban and, and commercial revitalization, um, downtown revitalization, um, and yet it has to have a reason. And you can't just say, well, we're going to revitalize if there's not an economic reason for that. So a lot of our focus has been trying to build a regional economic strategy that not dictating what each town should do about that strategy, 
but within a diverse set of menu of things that they could be thinking about, let them to identify where is our niche in that and where can we be successful? What do we have to offer? And so what does that look like? Uh, if you're sitting at the foot of Mount Rogers National Recreation Area with so many thousands of visitors going there and yet you haven't captured the economic potential of that, then you ought to reorient your town to thinking about how do we become the gateway to Mount Rogers National Recreation Area? Or increasingly, um, the blue ways, the rivers that people want to get on and kayak and fish and get out and, you know, the towns are right there on the waterway, yet nobody's ever thought about what's the economic impact of capturing the traveling public who are going to come to that asset. Uh, and so the towns then begin to think about, okay, what do I need? I need restaurants, I need hotel, I need, um, I need uh, outfitters, I need to think about uh, what, it, what do I need to be successful in that. And so where we see those uh, uh, opportunities are where people now are saying, you know, what, uh, how I'm going to invest to make economic activity happen in my town, and that starts to spread out. But that key to that is not one town doing it by themselves, but them linking to some kind of regional strategy. And so I think that's the, the opportunity, and that's where we're putting most of our emphasis right now. Good. So Olivia, from your perspective as a program manager and as you review projects, what, what are the things that you like to see? What do you consider as a, a, the, you know, what does successful collaboration look like? What, what are elements in a project that you want to see that would make that project successful? You know, oftentimes when we do pre-applications in North Carolina and every state does the ARC application process a little different. And sometimes when a pre-app comes in, I will have never heard anything about that project. And our pre-apps are no more than 10 pages long. And I have to base whether I'm going to ask for a full application sometimes on a couple paragraphs. In those projects that have actually called me or had a conversation with an LDD director are a little stronger in that pre-application process because I have an idea of what's, what the project's about. Projects that are really successful for me are those that have partners. And not just partners on pa paper. Partners where folks have sat around a table they all are supportive of the, the same mission or, and are in agreement of what their role is going to be and how they're going to help move that project forward. Um, you know, we always ask, what kind of plan is this project tied to? And a lot of times, folks will just reference their local SEDs or county economic de development plan. And w sometimes I have to go back and ask a question, how is this really tied to your SEDs? Or did you just quote your SEDs just to check a box? And the projects that are really successful can really document for you how they're building on a plan. That this is not just a project that they saw, that there was a grant announcement for, that they could apply for $100,000, and so they were going to go after it. That they're thoughtful. Um, another key component, and Jill mentioned, is sustainability. We, um, I think all the four folks up here would say that we all look at projects and say, after the ARC investment is done, will this project still be operational, regardless of what it is? And sometimes going into it, you think yes, and during the course of the project, things happen, and sometimes projects don't work. But the vast majority of projects do work when they have thought through their sustainability piece. And they've thought through, who are the partners that we need to make this sustainable? Um, whether that's a water infrastructure system, figuring out after you go in and put in the, the system, how, are, how is that community going to maintain that system? What, are, what does that community need to do? Um, we have had some projects in North Carolina, and I think, Scott, when we had the conversation about this panel, you asked, when have some projects not worked? And we have funded a couple of projects that haven't worked. One. Um, was a, a kitchen incubator in a community that they had all the partners, they had a sustainability plan, but they didn't take one thing into account. They didn't take into account what would happen if the individual who was the spark plug for that project got tired of being at that facility 24 seven and she decided her, her passion was gone. What would happen? And that's what happened. After everybody's money had gone in, it had been operational, it was a great project. Um, we would showcase it. We brought federal co-chair there. We brought all these people there to see it because it was great. When that one individual left, the project closed. And there were efforts, and there, there's, there have been efforts since then to revitalize that project. 
But that wasn't something at that time that I would have asked in the application project as part of the sustainability. What's going to happen if you're the spark plug for this project leaves? And so that's something now that we, we think about it a little differently in North Carolina um, for projects. You can't have one person that's going to do it all. You have to have those partners at the table who are committed to making this last. Or it's, or it's going to be one-off investment, which is not, not necessarily what we want to be doing. We want to make investments that are long-lasting, that I can drive through a community. I drove past one on the way here um, on Monday in Boone. We made a similar investment in an um, incubator, and it's now the Appalachian Enterprise Center. And I can point to that's an investment that we made seven or eight years ago that is still operational. And so really looking at the partners and sustainability is what really focus on. Jill, um, as a local development district and the projects that uh, you review, what, what do you look for as you're, you're working with uh, your folks and your communities for um, how, do, how do they build successful projects and the collaborations? Well, I think, you know, when we've talked about it, I, I would probably be mimicking exactly what Bill and Olivia said. It's, it's making sure that, you know, I think sustainability is, is absolutely that key that gets us all to the table. And it's the collaboration. One project that comes to mind, and it's one that Earl and Guy and I visited a couple years ago that was not an ARC project, but we're looking to ARC for assistance now, is an entrepreneurship academy that we visited in Mercer County. It was funded by a state program. Um, the previous administration had a grant program, and, they, and uh, this group, which was um, the intermediate unit, it was the local municipality, it was uh, two school districts, and uh, they entered into an agreement and it was funded for two years and it was the Entrepreneurship Academy. And much like vocational and technical schools, these individuals would go to their home school for half a day and then they would come to the Entrepreneurship Academy for the afternoon. And it has been successful. They put together business plans, they had to market, a couple of them have actually taken those and run with them. Um, I, I see it as the future of, you know, when we talk about modeling and we talk about things that will move our region forward or even just move the model forward, you know, when we, and I, I always say that I think it's a missing component of vocational and technical schools is, you know, if you teach someone to weld or you teach someone to do hair, if you don't teach them the entrepreneurial part of that, how do they run a business? So I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there. But much like changes in, in administrations, that grant ap opportunity went away for that group. So they started with two school districts. They're now trying to continue that. I think they're up to five now. The school districts are starting to put more skin in the game, but there's still a gap. And that's, you know, I think that's the role for ARC is, is filling that gap, but seeing the bigger picture. I think in time, when you see the successes and you see the continuation of that program, more school districts will get involved. More schools will look at them as another piece of that puzzle for vocation and for um, uh, looking at opportunities for students and this program will become sustainable without ARC, but ARC will be, you know, that conduit, that, that, that gap that fills in to get everyone else on board and, and moves that project forward. Great. Earl, I deliberately wanted to ask you this question and on topic last, because uh, as projects all move through the process, they come across your desk last. <laughs> and uh, you're, you're the one that sits down and then reviews these applications, looks at them, you do your research. As you're doing that and you're looking at these projects, what, what are you looking for for successful projects and, and what does good collaboration look like as you're working through this? Well, you know, when you read through these, these applications, by the time they get to me, um, you understand that a lot of people have already <laughs> danced through them have asked a lot of questions and have put a lot of energy and a lot of their self into this project and are very committed to it. Um, and so it's, it, it, it can be a little challenging to raise your hand and ask a question uh, that may have been asked before. Uh, it doesn't necessarily show up in the file, but you know, you're just kind of concerned about it or you, you look at it and you kind of, you Google it and you just sort of see what the deal is and what the other pieces of it are. And you, um, so what I try to look at is really, is there a return to the taxpayer? 
Is there a benefit to working families? Does it contribute to bringing a community um, closer to economic parity? Um, and is it part of a plan? Is it, is it, you know, when a project, when an individual expenditure is a part of an overall strategy and it's contributing to the work of revitalizing and strengthening a community within a plan that people have thought about is much different than that same exact expenditure that is off here and it's going to be done once and it was that county commissioner's turn to get a grant and so they want that thing that's not very attractive um, because we're going to do it once it's going to be it's, it's just like this expenditure over here but this expenditure has so much more leverage and so much more long-term impact it connects the dots so much better because it's been a part of the planning process and um, initiatives that are part of a process that includes citizen enga engagement, those are the strongest projects of all uh, and the most interesting and really the most impactful. You know, there was a project in, uh, in North, Western North Carolina a few years ago um, that involved um, uh, a citizen engagement process to preserve the ridge tops of, of uh, of mountains, basically, that they had gone through a lot of uh, uh, development uh, of second homes, which uh, really th threatened the the um, the natural beauty of communities. And the community sat down, community sat down, and worked through a strategy on how to what is it they could do, what is it they needed to do to make sure that this beautiful these beautiful communities that folks had moved into and wanted to live in continued to be beautiful places and not strip malls. Uh, and so it's, it, that work is, is really incredible. The work that, that um, the bill has talked about and that we showcase all the time around the Crooked Road, that now uh, Mayor Johnson from Ohio is, uh, is plagiarizing and calling the Wandy Road in Ohio. Um, uh, I mean, it's, it's that type of work that really, uh, that we know is a great investment. We know is, uh, it's gonna take a while to, to accomplish. A few months ago, uh, I was having dinner with um, uh, some folks and I was very excited about the, about the power appropriation that uh, we had $50 million. It was the second, it's the second largest appropriation for non-highway work in ARC history. That is like, I'm feeling great about this, you know? I'm just feeling really good. And my friend said to me, well, we know Earl, that's just like a drop in the bucket. Um, that's just a start. And he was right. But you know, our job at ARC, I think, is to start stuff, is to start trouble. And the more trouble that we can start, I'm really glad the congressman left, the more trouble that we can start, um, we're not gonna pay for the whole thing. But we're, going to, but we're going to start it. And that's our contribution to this, is, is allowing local officials the opportunity to take a risk. And we're willing to take, and our job is about taking risks as well. And for us to take a risk, it's important that it be a thoughtful, deliberative process where we're not just throwing federal money around. Because I don't throw federal money around. I invest taxpayer resources, and it needs to be done, and we need to do it in a way that we're all very proud of, and that we see and we believe that it's going to change our communities. That's what I look for. Well, and that's a great segue for uh, uh, we're talking about the stirring up some trouble, and, and, and a lot of times that trouble starts to get stirred is because somebody has an aha moment about a project or a situation. Um, a program, or even, and how are we going to solve this problem? I'm going to throw it open to see which one of you want to start off with. Uh, to tell us about a time where there was an aha moment that really has moved forward into collaboration into a successful project. I'm 
going to take this from a 10,000 foot perspective as I represent the 73 LDDs in our region. Because when we talked about this aha moment last week when we were on our conference call, so Scott didn't throw any zingers at us, we said, tell us exactly what you're going to ask. <laughs> but yet I haven't. But yet he's, <laughs> yeah. We'll deal with that later. <laughs> the aha moment for me, and like I said, I've, I've kind of grown up in the LDD system. Um, you know, when you come into the LDD system as a coordinator, which, you know, is, the, is, is really those taskmasters, and, and you've got a program and you do that. Um, you don't realize that you're part of something bigger. You're doing what you're doing. And as I've moved kind of up through the ranks and even getting to the executive director position, you're still kind of insulated in that world that you live in within your LDD or within your state. Um, I've been fortunate enough for the last year and a half to represent Pennsylvania on the DDAA, the department, the, the, no, now, there you go. I knew I'd miss that something up this, this morning. Um, so, so the one, the aha moment for me is as I sit around with my, with the other states and the other representatives and the other di uh, directors is there's 73 of us, and if you walk through the door of any one of us, you would see a completely different organization. Um, even within the seven LDDs within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We have our core components, and if you come to CEDACOG, or if you come to North Central, or you come to Southwest, you're going to see those core components, but you're going to see all those other things. And you're going to see those things that ARC has afforded us to do to meet the needs of the region that we serve. And if you go to South Carolina and visit Steve, or if you go over to Misty's region in, uh, in Ohio, hers are going to look very, very different than what ours are, but I think the core part of what makes us relevant is that we keep investing and we keep talking and we keep building collaborations that allow us to move our regions forward and as we move our county our region our state we're moving the ARC region forward so my aha moment is we are as different as we are the same but we continue to strive to do what works for us and that helps us as a whole I'm going to slip two in. Um, so in a prior life, I was the director of the Center on Rural Development in Virginia. Um, it was a gubernatorial initiative, and somebody said, you're the guy, we want to head this, and I thought this was great. And they said, you can hire six people. I thought that was great. And then they told me I had a budget of $350,000. And it's like, what? <laughs> and so you're trying to figure out, well, what do, you, what do you do if you don't have resources? And so you had very limited resources. And we had um, did a lot of thinking about this, um, and we used our very limited resources on what we call innovation grants, and so they were very small investments, uh, but in very bold ideas. So out of that came the state's first microenterprise initiative. Um, it became uh, essentially the groundwork that was laid for what later became our statewide community development bank. Uh, so these were things where when you, when you didn't have big expectations in terms of resources, uh, we actually uh, traded that for bigger ideas. The other thing that came out of that though, that I thought was, and it's, and it's been the foundation for many, many years now of our efforts, was that the power of bringing people together in a thoughtful way to collaborate. And so we built skills and staff on um, facilitation, collaboration, bringing people together, keeping an open dialogue, making sure all points of view were coming to the table, broadening the leadership, not just having it have to be the local elected officials, but bringing other uh, key stakeholders to the table. Uh, and when I first started that, I had this angst of like, oh my gosh, that you know we're going to do all this work and we're you know, not going to have anything to show for it. The reality was, all of that ended up being very impactful and it unlocked many other doors. So that's become kind of a cornerstone of just about everything we've done. The other project is more tangible and, and more recent. Um, staff came to me and said, we've got a community in Southwest Virginia, it's in the ARC region, and um, they want to do a pop-up business plan competition. And I'm thinking like, okay, um, but just from what's been mentioned earlier, it sounds like one and done, you know, how is this really going to change and move things in a in a, a different direction. So in this community, they did their first pop-up business plan competition. They got vacant property owners to agree to put the, uh, put like 
six months free rent for the uh, winning business plans. Um, what they have done now, I think they're on their fifth or sixth, I don't know if anyone from Marion, Virginia is here, but um, they're about on their fifth or sixth pop-up competition. Every storefront downtown is full. They're now having to move out into other commercial areas outside of the downtown. Um, they won the title from SBA of Entrepreneurial Community of the Year about three or four years ago. They've been a national model. So the, the point of that is the idea that comes out of nowhere and hits you upside the head and you think, oh gosh, I'm not sure that's a good investment of resources, ends up being the one that just kind of like, wow, this has really been a signature kind of a focus of trying to then get other communities, and there are a number of people in the room involved in that in Virginia, uh, to be more focused on this whole entrepreneurial ecosystem. So, you know, the idea of, of just always keeping your mind open to where the possibilities are and trusting that, that with collaboration, a lot of different great folks coming to the table end up having great outcomes. That would be the learning. I've had a number of aha moments. Um, and one of those is not necessarily focused on North Carolina, but for me as a program manager, and if the other program managers or ARC staff from across the region could raise your hand, I know you're all in here, Neil and several others, um, we learn from each other. And there are 420 counties in ARC. It goes from northern Mississippi to southern New York. But we're, we all have a lot of similarities. And the aha moment for me is, one of the best for me has been that I can pick up the phone and call Neil Fowler in Pennsylvania and throw something at Neil and say, Neil, have you ever dealt with this? And how did you deal with it? How did a community figure out how to solve that problem. We have that dialogue back and forth all the time amongst program managers and with LDD folks, and I think Jill's comment about all the, the 73 LDDs all look very different, but they have similarities and they, they learn from each other. It's that none of us need to reinvent the wheel. Um, Earl mentioned that Tom Johnson from Ohio is borrowing from what has happened in Southwest Virginia, and that came from an emerging opportunities discussion that several of the program managers and some other folks that we invited, and Tom was one of the folks we invited to DC for some conversations and then into the region, and we went into Marion in Southwest Virginia, and we saw what has not been an overnight success with the Crooked Road, but how there were strategic investments in that region that now are, are being very fruitful. And so, I think all the program managers use examples like that as we have similar communities in our, in our state. How do we learn and borrow from what has already been done and mold it for what we can do in our communities with the resources we have access to? Just like Bill said, ARC in the commerce budget in North Carolina is a, it's a tiny little piece of the pie. It's very tiny. But I always tell people, the one of the best things about ARC is everybody else that comes to the table because you have ARC. You get folks from other state agencies at the table, you get folks from USDA at the table, you get mayors, you get county commissioners, you get foundation folks, you get workforce development folks. And ARC historically has been able to get all those folks at the table to move the needle. And for me as a program manager, being, under, being able to understand how the needle has been moved in other communities that are similar has been one of the best aha moments for me. That I can pick up the phone and I can call Brooksy in Tennessee or Jill in South Carolina and say, I got this community or I have this region and they're ripe to do something and I can't figure out what that something is. Can you help me think through this? And it, it really is um, coming from a CDBG background, um, which several of you know a lot about CDBG. This is a family. I mean, the federal office, the commission staff that Scott oversees, and the, the LDDs, we all kind of, we get in there and the, we row the boat together. And we have to all have the same vision in mind of where we're rowing that boat with the understanding that others have rowed it before us. And what do we learn from them so that we can keep rowing in the right direction? So I've learned a lot uh, the last six years. Um, there are a couple of, there are a couple of um, th these are not projects, but these are just ways of thinking about the world uh, that sort of came out of a bolt of light in some place. Um, 
in traveling throughout the region early on, I um, all of a sudden it just dawned on me that how so many people, so many folks in so many parts of the region um, really do get up every day to try to figure out how to make their communities better places. Um, and the diversity of those interests, the diversity of those activities, and the energy that they bring to that effort, and the tenacity and the commitment is amazing. And in this position, you get to see it all. You get to see it, it you get to engage in that and um, connect with that in you know, upstate New York and northeast Mississippi and you know, Morgan County, Alabama and um, all these 420 counties that are in different spots in their history, in their economics, in their demographics, in their challenges of how they work with each other and they engage each people. And it really is this army of folks. And um, it just it's, it amazes me to, to have and to see this experience. The other thing is that these folks oftentimes don't, well, virtually all the time, don't know each other. Um, and and some, sometimes that's true of folks who, who do similar work within the same state, within 15 or 20 miles of each other. I mean, it's amazing that I'm, sh I'm shocked at the people who I introduced to each other who I was sure had known each other and had worked together for years, but in fact, didn't. But it's that army was, was my first aha moment. The second one was in trying to think about how to talk about Appalachia. There's a lot of bad stuff you can say. There's a lot of really depressing things you can focus on. But that really wasn't my job. My job is really to figure out how to make federal dollars go in a way to provide opportunities. And as we work through and, and try to, to think through how to build the entrepreneurial ecosystem and how to talk about that, and there were a lot of different ideas and a lot of different thoughts. And it was like, how do we, how do we structure this so we're inclusive of the entire region, that we are really focused on uh, the entrepreneur and the investment? And how do we take the assets and really help try to bring them together and bring them up? How do we make it an investment. How do we make it an investment opportunity? And one day we're sitting around my table and, and it's and all of a sudden I said, you know what? Appalachia is the next great investment opportunity in America. Now it didn't come out that well the first time. But it, it was within, within 15 or 20 minutes we, uh, <laughs> we corrected the grammar. Uh, we uh, added a, f a few more uh, appropriate words and took out a lot that didn't need to fit in. Um, but it was, that phrase really came from the trips. It really came from the engagement. It came from uh, approving about 98% of the applications that come through and not agreeing to sign about 2% of them, which is always a very difficult experience, as all of the folks on the stage know. Um, but that was really, a, uh, for me, was a, was, uh, was, a, was a great aha moment that has really helped me frame how to look at the region, how to work, look at the mission of ARC, and how to try to, um, um, to, to um, have, our, be, have us in a position that we help support and lead uh, this region to uh, do really what it, its potential is. Great. Earl, that was a great way to wrap this up. I want to thank the panel for your time, your input, your insights. I hope all of you found this uh, very beneficial as a kickoff and to kind of frame the conference. Uh, so let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>